I'm Michelle Merrill. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow in the Environment and Sustainability Research Cluster at Nanyang Technological University. I was invited to give a talk about sustainability. To me, sustainability is about finding ways to save what matters so that the things I love have some chance of surviving into the future. So I'm going to talk about what matters to me, why that got me interested in sustainability, and why I came here to work on how universities in Asia are teaching sustainability. But I'm also going to ask you to think about what's important to you, why and how you might want to engage with sustainability challenges, and some things we can do to create a more sustainable future. So think for a moment about something you really care about. What is something that matters to you? What matters to me is people. The amazing things we can do thanks to our amazing brains. How good humans are at figuring things out and then learning about those things from each other. That's what drew me into studying anthropology. I wanted to understand how our abilities as social learners had evolved from simpler beginnings, but I didn't have a time machine to watch how our ancient ancestors learned from one another. And that led me to something else that matters to me, the other great apes. I did my PhD on orangutan cultures based on fieldwork and comparative studies of orangutan populations. When we see something like different kinds of tool use in different populations of wild chimpanzees, we are seeing very simple forms of cultural variation. These are cultures in other species, provided we are willing to define culture very broadly. One Japanese primatologist pared culture down to its essence, socially transmitted adjustable behavior. In other words, cultural variation is all about social learning. The most fruitful work for looking for non-human cultures has been amongst our closest relatives, the other great apes. We shared a common ancestor with these other apes about 15 million years ago. Orangutans are more distantly related to the other great apes who shared a common ancestor only as recently as seven million years ago. The ancestors of humans and the two species uh, in the genus Pan, bonobos and chimpanzees, they only split a little, long, a little while after that. And then the lineages leading to these two pan, pan species diverged less than three million years ago. Now, because we're the ones making the definitions, we can be pretty sure that however we're going to define culture, humans have what it takes. Yet it's still interesting to look for evidence of culture in our closest relatives, because the capacities we share with the other great apes are likely inherited from our common ancestors. So if we find orangutans or chimpanzees doing something that looks like culture, there's a good chance that 15 million years ago, our last common ancestor was able to do it too. Initially, I was really interested in studying social interactions and social learning in one of the two living species that shared our most recent common ancestor, and that was the bonobos. I went to get a PhD on this topic at Duke University in the USA, and I plan to do my research studying bonobos in their African rainforest home. Unfortunately, bonobos only live in this area south of the Congo River, which falls entirely within the country that was called Zaire when I got there in 1996. In response to an amazingly corrupt government, widespread poverty, and many other factors, a civil war started while I was there. 
The fighting initially was well to the east of the country at first. But the fighters rapidly moved across the country toward the capital in the west. I got out of the country, now called the Democratic Republic of Congo, before they moved through the area right in the center here where my field site was. So I went back to Duke University. And back at Duke, I realized it wouldn't be safe to go back to Zaire and continue my bonobo research. So I started looking for another species to study to complete my PhD. About that time, another professor at Duke, Carl von Scheich, and especially his grad student, Elizabeth Fox, and Indonesian researcher, Arnold Sitampol, they discovered a tool culture in one population at a research site called Swak Balimbing on Sumatra. Even bonobos didn't have tool use cultures. I decided I should go learn more about orangutan learning. So I went to the rainforest of northern Sumatra to study social learning and the origins of culture in orangutans. This one population at this site called Swak Balimbing was the only place where orangutans were regularly making and using tools. They would modify twigs to get honey out of tree holes where stingless bees built their nests. And to get the seeds out of this fruit called anisia. The anisia is very hard to break open and it's lined in here with these little hairs that are like fiberglass slivers. At other places where orangutan lives, they didn't bother trying to get the seeds out. Um, but at Swak, they seem to have solved the problem. The tough shells of the Nisia do open a little bit, so with a twig, you can pry out the seeds inside without getting a finger full of slivers. I'll show you a little video of that. Some clever orangutan must have figured this out at some point, and now all of the orangutans at Swak were doing it. I wanted to see if these orangutans were more gregarious, more socially tolerant or friendly than orangutans elsewhere, to explain why they've been able to learn this trick from one another. You can see they are very tolerant of curious onlookers, as this male, Musa, lets this adolescent female, Ati, watch what he's doing. They are not believed to be related to one another. And Adi already knows how to use a tool to extract seeds from Nisia at the time this video was taken, but she actually drops her Nisia fruit apparently to focus on observing Musa as he makes and modifies a new tool. Now, I was comparing the orangutans who lived at Swakalimbing with orangutans who lived in another forest on Sumatra called Katambe. When I looked at how much time adult females spent in social proximity with other, another adult at less than two meters, less than 10 meters, or less than 50 meters distance, I found that the sites were quite different. These represent the mean percent time with the nearest independent adult orangutan um, at these different distances for six females at each site. The difference in time spent with the nearest neighbor within two meters was very significant. I would not have been able to do my research without a lot of support from others. Financial support from the Leakey Foundation and NSF allowed me to do this kind of field research, but it was really the people who I met there that made it possible.
As I thought about what I had learned during my research and talked about it with my advisor and other orangutan researchers later, I realized that this kind of social learning was all about being able to connect with others in a friendly way. That's what primatologists are talking about when they use the term social tolerance. And it occurred to me that this kind of social tolerance, while important in orangutans, was probably even more important in the evolution of the human lineage. More social tolerance means that you spend more time close to others, so you have more chances to learn from any one individual. Also, that you have more different individuals that you're willing to be close to, so you have more different models to learn from. If you have both of those, you're going to have a lot more chances to learn anything anyone else around might have figured out about the best way to do things, how to get more of what you need in order to survive. If everyone around is a bit more efficient, you might not have to compete so much for the resources you need, and that might make it even easier to be more socially tolerant. This would have created a kind of reinforcing feedback loop. Usually that would go until you come up to some resource cap that actually does lead to competition. That seems to have been what placed limitations on other species. But somehow, our ancestors found ways around that, and it eventually led to us growing these huge resource-intensive brains just to get better at doing this kind of social learning. This was so cool. This was just what I had wanted to learn about when I went out to study orangutans. It was why I put up with the swamps and the mud and the mosquitoes and the leeches. And I would love it if those were the only kinds of stories I was bringing back from my field work. Unfortunately, there were other things I observed out there as well. Illegal loggers were coming into the supposedly protected national park where I was working. We tried to get the authorities to stop them, but no one wanted to do anything. The loggers were threatening us, and they were the ones with the chainsaws. This was unique, prime orangutan habitat. This was the only place where orangutans regularly made and used tools as a local tradition. The area was being selectively logged, with the chainsaws going for months before the research staff finally decided we had to abandon the site. Swak Balimbing Research Station was closed by the end of 1999 due to this illegal logging for high-value tropical hardwoods. In 2011, uh, some looser ecosystem researchers went back and they reported that some orangutans had returned to the site and they were again using tools. But it's likely that many of the orangutan mothers I watched lost their young babies. And some orangutans probably never came back to swap the limbing after that level of disturbance. Like many primate species, orangutans are really in danger of extinction. There are fewer Sumatran orangutans left in the wild than there are faculty and staff at NTU, less than 7,000 Sumatran orangutans. The number of orangutans in Borneo is only about twice the number of students here at NTU, around 60,000. That's it. That's all the orangutans left in the wild. Some experts believe they may be extinct in the wild within the next 25 years or so. And they're not alone in that. Over 70% of the primate species in Asia are threatened with extinction, and at least two dozen species are critically endangered. 
Now I'm going to give you a little multiple choice quiz. So, sight unseen. I bet you think the answer is going to be C. Right? You know, when you're taking a multiple choice quiz, the answer is probably C. So here are your options. Are the biggest threats to endangered primate species paper products, packaged pastries, primate poaching, or portable phones? I bet you still think it's C. Well, let's have a look at that one first, since it's the most obvious connection to primate survival. Poaching and capture is a real danger to many primate species. Some of the pictures I'm about to show, a couple of them are pretty disturbing, so you don't have to look if you don't want to. So hunting primates for what is called bushmeat is a major problem throughout the tropics. Where it's small scale hunting just to feed the hunter and the hunter's families, uh, what we call subsistence hunting, that isn't really a problem. That's been happening for thousands of years. When it becomes a problem is when well-armed hunters go out to collect enough to sell at market. And not just primates, but lots of other wild forest species like these. Even when it's not the primates themselves that are being hunted for bushmeat, if other species like antelope are being hunted, primates are often injured or killed in the traps and snares set for those other species. Safe to look again now. Even when the intention is to capture live primates to sell as pets, lots of primates die because of capture for the pet trade. People want infants or juveniles as pets, but primate mothers are very protective about holding on to their babies. So to get a baby chimpanzee or orangutan away from its mother, poachers usually have to kill the mothers. Many of the infants are so traumatized by the experience of being captured that they die before ever getting to market. So for every pet primate taken from the wild and sold, you probably have three or four others that are dead. Illegal hunting, poaching for primates, uh, poaching primates for bushmeat or for the pet trade. Yes, that's very bad for some primates. Many species are threatened because of this, but it turns out there are things that are even worse. For instance, one of the worst things for lots of primate species is war. War is really bad for humans, and it's just as bad for some other primates too. Wars often start because of some sense of injustice, or that there are social problems that aren't being resolved. Obviously, they lead to a lot of direct harm to people. But then there's indirect harm to other people and to other primates and their habitats. During wars, people's priorities shift. Usually, they focus so much on combat, they stop worrying about anything else. The patrols and weapons that might once have been available to resist poachers are now being redeployed. Weapons are available to hungry soldiers on the move through rainforests. They're far from home. They're likely to hunt and kill anything they think they can eat, and they won't be worrying if there will be any more in the area a year from now. Now, those weapons are not free. Somehow, someone has to make money to purchase them. Why do these wars start? How do they keep going? Who pays for them? In Central Africa, we know that a lot of these wars are closely related to the money to be made from mining. People in the Congo are mined for diamonds, for gold, copper, cobalt, zinc, tin, and especially an ore called coltan. Mining for coltan is a dirty and dangerous job that people only take on when they feel they have no other choices or when they're being held at gunpoint. So what is coltan? 
Well, have you ever had a mobile phone or a laptop computer or a tablet? If you have it, you have a Coltan product. Coltan is an ore that we use to get tantalum. Coltan ore is only found in a few places in the world. And tantalum is what has made the shrinking of electronics devices over the last couple of decades possible. It's found in mobile phones, laptop computers, and other electronics that we want to be small and lightweight. The global market for coltan really took off in the mid-1990s. And like the wars in Congo, it's been going ever since. When people are involved in mining tropical areas, they often create a new market for bushmeat, as all those miners need to be fed to be, keep working. They also invariably clear a lot of land, eliminating primate habitat. But there are other reasons primate habitats get cleared. Selective logging for timber, like what I saw at Swakvalimbing, is bad. It opens up forest and the forests dry out. It degrades the habitat for orangutans, monkeys, and other forest animals like tigers and sun bears. But when it gets really bad is when there's a clear cut. This is often done by people who are after pulp and paper. And once the land is logged, it becomes a target for further clearing to make way for farming. The most efficient way to clear out rainforests, to make room for farming, is to burn down these remaining stumps and small trees. This slash and burn or swit in agriculture can be practiced sustainably. By small scale subsistence farmers, it's been done for thousands of years on Borneo, Sumatra, and Peninsular Malaysia. But this increasing pressure to grow export commodities has encouraged ever more land clearing. When that's combined with draining the peat swamps, like this area called Tripa that's very close to Swak Balimbing in northern Sumatra, these fires not only burn the above ground material from the trees, they also burn and release the stored carbon from the peat swamps. This can create massive fires that burn for weeks or months. And when you get fires like that, you get haze. Fires set to clear land for oil palm or other plantations can easily burn out of control, especially in dry years like this year. These plantations are now spreading all over Southeast Asia, plus the tropical regions of Africa and some in South America. A lot of it is for oil palms. So what's an oil palm anyway? Well. These are grown to get palm oil. And that palm oil from these plantations goes into almost everything. Cooking oil, cosmetics and shampoos, snack foods. Like our packaged pastry. When you check the ingredients list, you'll often see some reference to palm oil or shortening. Palm oil also gets processed into things like sodium lauryl sulfate, sodium kernelate, and lots of other little things that only chemistry majors would probably recognize. And then it gets put into all kinds of cosmetics and soaps and foods. Now, who would have guessed that pastries and shampoos are contributing to the extinction of orangutans? So what do you do about problems like this, where everything is so tangled up in everything else? When I was a teenager, this book came out called 50 Simple Things You Can Do to Save the Earth. And I did my best to do those things. But given what I'd seen in Africa and then in Indonesia, it was becoming pretty clear to me that those 50 simple things just weren't going to cover it. The problems were much bigger and more complex than that.
it's become pretty clear to most scientists that what we're doing now isn't remotely close to sustainable. These unsustainable conditions are already leading to problems for people and the expectation is that it could get worse. Right now, we appear to be well outside what could be called the safe operating space for humanity. This zone of activities where we can be reasonably sure that we're not compromising the future in terms of climate change, land use change, nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, and especially biodiversity loss. And there are a few places where scientists have said, we aren't yet able to determine where the boundaries are and we don't know whether or not we've crossed them. One of those is atmospheric aerosols, kinds of air pollution. Another is novel entities, including new chemicals and plastics. We know that there are a lot of these, but we don't know if we're still in the green, or if we've crossed over into the yellow or if we've crossed well into the red. We do know that they're a problem. For instance, a new study in the February 13th issue of the journal Science this year calculated that about 8 million tons of plastic waste wound up in the world's oceans in 2010. That's equal to five grocery bags filled with plastic for every foot of coastline in the world. They predict it's going to get even worse, up to 9 million tons this year. Why would we make a mess like this? How would we get ourselves into so much trouble? When we think about it, it wasn't even a lack of education that led us here. So much as it's about what is and isn't included in higher education. That's why I got interested in education for sustainability. But I should step back for a moment and talk a little bit about what we mean when we say sustainability. You may have heard this very common definition uh, from a UN group called the Brundtland Commission. Sustainability is meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This is good. It carries this implication of intergenerational justice. It's not okay to steal from our grandkids so that we can pay our rent now. However, this definition does sound like it was written by a committee, which is why sometimes I prefer uh, William McDonough's more poetic approach. Sustainability is about ensuring a prosperous future, not just for our future, not just for our own children, but for all children of all species, for all time. When consultants talk about sustainability in the business world, they recommend that people try and connect and balance these three different worldviews that focus on the economy, that focus on the society and social problems, or that focus on the environment. They call this the triple bottom line, planet, people, and profits, or environment, economics, and equity. And it's a great idea keeping all of those in balance when we try and make decisions. And yet, even this drastically overlooks the reality of the situation. The economy is just one aspect of our societies. And our economies and our societies are completely dependent on the healthy function of the environments where they're taking place. And now that's taking place at the global scale. So as I thought about this scale of sustainability, I started wondering 
how could we start doing things better and taking sustainability seriously? To answer this, I decided I needed to focus on how to improve how we do higher education to help make sustainability something that's always included in what tomorrow's leaders learn. I came here to Nanyang Technological University to help with a project bringing together professors from this large part of Asia to discuss how we can improve education for sustainability at Asian universities. Because there's nowhere else on earth that's more important for this. This area includes some of the fastest growing economies in the world. And with three of the four most populous countries on the planet, this part of Asia includes half the world's current population of 7.2 billion humans. Or to put it another way, more people live inside this highlighted circle on the globe than live outside of it. And while it's true that per person, North Americans and Europeans have a much larger carbon footprint, this part of Asia accounts for over one third of global greenhouse gas emissions and it's growing very fast. As you know, I got passionate about working for sustainability because of the deforestation I witnessed on Sumatra when I was studying orangutan behavior 16 years ago. We're just discovering that preserving the unique tropical forests of Southeast Asia is even more important than many of us realized at that time. Not only are these critical their critical biodiversity hotspots in these countries. But it turns out these forests are much more effective at capturing and storing carbon than rainforests in South America, according to some work that was published just last year. So if I can help transform how we educate the best educated leaders, in half the world, I think I'll be doing something very important to make life better for orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, and especially for people. Over a century ago, the great conservation pioneer John Muir said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. It's all connected. So you can start working on improving sustainability almost anywhere, and eventually it will affect almost everything. If you're teaching, you can find ways to incorporate sustainability into almost any class. If you're a student, you can ask sustainability questions, and you can choose assignment topics that address sustainability. Another amazing thing about sustainability and this incredible interconnection is that when you're working to make things more sustainable, you often end up solving many problems at the same time. So let's say you decided you're just disgusted by all the plastics going into the oceans. Well, you can help clean up with our friends in Earthlink, the sustainability club for NTU students. or as you'd be learning in the movie Tapped, you can take actions that reduce the demand for plastics production in the first place. And steps that might reduce our overpumping of freshwater reserves and our exposure to some toxic chemicals too. Are you worried that you might be complicit in war, child labor, and primate extinctions because you like to take selfies and share them with your friends? You don't have to give up your gadgets as long as you commit to doing things to making using them more sustainable. Wait as long as you can to buy new ones. And when you do get a new device, make sure you do something responsible with your old one. Coltan and the problems that follow from it are why primate conservation organizations like the Jane Goodall Institute hold mobile phone recycling drives. And again, thanks to our friends here at Earthlink, you can even recycle your electronic pro products here on campus at NTU. 
you like to go outside and play, but you haven't been enjoying breathing the horrible haze that we've had here in Sumatra for the last few weeks? Want to help fix and reduce that awful stuff in the air and help save the orangutans? There's a group called PM Haze, Singapore-based homegrown movement to stop the haze, and they have five simple suggestions for you. First of all, if you cut back on certain foods and other products with a lot of oils, you're helping reduce the pressure for clearing ever more land for oil palm plantations. You're probably staying healthier too. When you do buy products that contain palm oil, you can look for certification from groups that are working to make palm oil production more sustainable and try to choose products and support companies that are working to improve sustainability. That way you'll be helping orangutans and you'll be helping your neighbor's children to breathe a little easier. If you're careful not to waste paper, you're reducing the need for clear cuts that dry out the forest and leave it susceptible to wildfires. Plus, you're reducing the energy needed for waste disposal and possibly even saving some money in the process. When you're buying paper, try to choose paper that's certified by reliable groups like the Forest Stewardship Council and try to get recycled paper whenever you can. And that way you're also saving land so that tigers and orangutans have a place to live. People working together can change what big companies do and that can change what the air quality rating is. Where just one voice might be ignored, thousands can send a resounding message. And in working to make your air better, you're making the air better for tigers and rhinos and sun bears and elephants and orangutans on Sumatra. And you're helping save their rainforest home. So you're reducing greenhouse gas emissions by saving forests and peatlands as carbon sinks. It's all connected. So just think about it for a moment. What is something that matters to you? Do you see how it might be connected to other sustainability issues? It really is all connected. So you can start working on improving sustainability almost anywhere, and eventually it will affect almost everything. Figure out those connections and tell people about it. When we connect with, learn from, and teach one another, we become so much more effective. We really can make the world a better place for ourselves, for the orangutans and bonobos, for our children and grandchildren. Start anywhere and don't stop, and always, always make connections.